First, a note of disclaimer, I'm not an environmental economist. Um, my closest I come is a knowledge of the history of technology, and Stuart said, well, come and see what light you may throw on this issue by talking about what you know about the history of technology, so let's see. First, growth based on more of the same is unsustainable. All major economic growth, if we look decade by decade, mainly consists of new products doing new things to new people and new ways of doing them. Just like we couldn't produce t today's t output with 1950s technology, so we will not be able to produce 2050s output with 2000s technology. But growth based on ideas is unlimited in extent. As far as we know, there's no limit to what we still need to find out and still don't know. But the future, of course, is hard to imagine, and we, one thing we can be sure of, it's full of surprises, because we don't know what new knowledge will be until we get it. The past growth, since the beginning of the first industrial revolution, has both dematerialized resource use and been energy saving, in the sense that the output per unit of GDP the inputs of resources and energy has fallen per unit of GDP pretty steadily since the Industrial Revolution. Of course, we consume more resources and energy because we have more people consuming more than they did in the past. What became important new technologies often start out as single purpose, costly and inefficient. Over time, they become multi-purpose, cheap to produce and efficient in their use. New technologies displace older ones, not because the older ones have been exhausted, but because the newer ones are more efficient in doing what the older ones did and can do new things that the older ones couldn't. Electricity proved to be more efficient in the factories than steam, and it did things that steam never could do. You couldn't power an electronic computer with a steam engine. The Stone Age did not end because we ran out of stone, but because bronze was a superior metal. The Bronze Age did not end because we ran out of bronze, because, but because iron was a superior metal. The Steam Age did not end because we ran out of steam or coal to power uh, steam engines and coal to power it, but because electricity was superior. And the Fossil Fuel Age will not end because we run out of fossil fuels, but because better energy sources become available, both in what they do, or it becomes more efficient, and because they can do things that fossil fuels could not. Typically, the older technology fights back when it is challenged by a new competing technology. For example, the three-masted sailing ship, the clipper ship that we think of as the great <coughs> victory of, of sail, was basically developed after sail came into competition with steam. In the past, these competitions between the old and new has been in who can be more efficient. Today, sadly, this competition is often transferred to the political sphere. The, the challenge technology fights back politically. In a current example, and in a, a view that can, I think, very hard not to say, use the term evil, um, there has been a fight in the United States to put a surcharge on electricity that people generate through their windmills and solar heating at home and then feed back into the electrical grid. Imagine, the Europeans are subsidizing the use of this technology and the Americans want to tax it. But this is what we see so often, that the fight back is transferred to the political sphere instead of being taking place in the, <coughs> in the economic sphere. As Richard Hawkins emphasizes, new technologies typically solve some problems in order to create others. With most technologies on balance, we would mostly agree that the balance is for the better, but it isn't necessarily so. Sometimes the balance is worse than, than the benefit. Major technologies often cause a burst of unqualified optimism, and the boom and bust that accompanies new technologies way back to the railway boom of the 19th century through the dot-com boom of 2000 uh, are examples of the euphoria that's often created by a new technology followed by a bust and then a reassessment to have a more realistic view of that technology. 
Now, my final point about, the, about technological history is <coughs> that technological trajectories are a mixture of the predictable and the unpredictable. The predictable aspect usually comes when a new fundamental transforming technology becomes established. Once you know it's established, you know it's going to go ahead. There'll be surprises. You have no idea of all the applications that will occur, but you can be pretty sure that that trajectory is going to continue. Uh, early history example, um, once the early scientists discovered in the early modern period that the atmosphere had weight, it was obvious that there was a power source, but it took two centuries before Newcomen invented a really efficient atmospheric engine to pump water out of the British coal mines. Once the problem of the double helix and how to deal with um, recombination, cutting bits apart and putting them back together were solved, it was clear that we were going to have a biological revolution. Once the technology of building materials up atom by atom became established, it was clear that we were going to have a nano revolution technology revolution. That, by the way, is going to transform us over the next 50 years in ways that are hard to imagine. The one thing we can be sure is it will be transforming. Now, new technologies in the government. The old argument that government should not seek to encourage specific technologies because they cannot pick winners has the effect of shifting discussion from the really important question, can we isolate the conditions under which it is likely that winners will be chosen and not lures, losers, which is the key issue. Um, to illustrate, um, we've, gone, we've listed many, many technologies in the United States which succeeded only with government assistance. Um, and I won't bother you with the list, it, it's long. Vernon Rutan, in his 2001 book, has investigated the technologies in which America was a leader and has discovered that virtually every one of them had public assistance at some critical point in their development. Ken Carl and I are studying every technology, a major technology from 1850, and discovered that the great bulk of them have public assistance at some point or another. So the real question is not can government pick winners, indeed they have, but they've also, of course, picked spectacular losers. So the question is, how do you d isolate the conditions for one rather than the other? Governments and the greening of the economy. We have some fully proven technologies. We have geothermal, we have wind, we have solar, and of course, atomic power. Um, we have some that we're not so sure about, fuel cells, superconductivity. We know the physics of it, but whether they become economically viable, we're not sure of. We also know how the, we have the technologies to deal with these. We have tax relief, we have subsidies, we have pollution taxes, and we have greening initiatives. What is needed is to provide the right price signals and the right encouragement for the development along trajectories that are already established. <coughs> I didn't stop my watch in time. Can you tell me where I am? Eight minutes, thank you. Okay, I want to look at a case study. Now, this is not all the answers, but just to illustrate. The sun's power is enormous, and it's free. Every day, the sun delivers 8,000 times as much energy to the earth as we use in all our activities. So harnessing one eight thousandth of it would satisfy all our energy needs. <coughs> the cost of doing a good part of this, <coughs> excuse me, through solar panels has plummeted over the, the years. A, an installation that cost $50,000 in 2008 cost $6,500 today. Now that is spectacular. <coughs> and a similar trajectory will be found with thermal heating, although it's a little further behind. Now this leads me to make two related points with the social cost and what governments can do. Importantly, because the costs of renewable energy sources are falling rapidly and are already economic with solar and wind, the cost of full changeover from fossil fuels to renewable energy is also falling. I've argued often that changing over would have only small negative effects on the GBT and might well enhance it 
by providing new jobs in many new efficient industries. Even today at the early stages of adoption, 145,000 people in the United States are employed in the solar energy industry, and hardly any of them at a minimum wage. <coughs> Excuse me. It follows that the well-meaning efforts of economists like Peter Victor and those like him are counterproductive when they argue that the cost of saving the Earth from eliminating <coughs> climate change disaster is it so high as it, we might even have to stop all economic growth. By persuading people that the costs are very high, they risk <coughs> inciting the reaction. Let's just ignore it and get on with enjoying life today while it lasts. It's hard, it has to be trumpeted that the doomsayers are wrong. We can solve the climate change problem within our lifetimes at a cost that might even bring positive gain. After all, when they arrive at their mature stage, solar and thermal and other power sources will be more efficient than fossil fuels if the past is any guide. Opportunities for the government. We've already passed the stage when the need to finance the R&D in solar is passed, but there is much need in other energy sources. Governments can play a big part. They must avoid the negative, such as when Ronald Reagan removed the solar panels that Gerald Ford put on the White House roof. Sort of, it's easy to laugh at that, but there are so many examples of this kind of waving the flag in the wrong direction that we want, they must be avoided. It can encourage the positive by encouraging the adaptation of things already proven. Here's one possible example. <clears throat> Governments could lend to all households the capital needed to convert to solar energy and to change the use in their house, such as LED lighting, to lower energy use. Then the money could be paid back at a rate equal to half the savings on the previous electricity bill. That way, the households save money immediately, and the government gets its money back eventually. The interest rate could be zero or some sp small positive rate. This is a win-win situation. The government is doing something green at no long-term direct cost, and the households are saving money immediately. This is only one of the many imaginable win-win situations that you get whenever it is true that the new energy source is, is more efficient than the old. Now, since we know the direction that we're going, basically directed assistance to particular energy developments is important and can be done. Now, Ken Carlo and I have studied uh, a large number of government initiatives, some of 30 to start with, and <coughs> from that have developed um, rules and regulation rules and about what to do and what not to do to encourage success and avoid failure. Now, I haven't got time to go into them, but I will say that you've had some good examples already from previous speakers and things such as don't try to make an innovation that doesn't fit into the structure of the economy and the people's knowledge that you have today. All too many ex illustrations of that happening. And there's a string of 25 different examples of what to do and what not to do. And this is where the discussion should be, not the government can't pick winners, but how do we encourage the, the government's activities pick better winners rather than losers. In, con in conclusion, it is a tragedy that few governments have taken the lead in pointing the way out of a serious problem, which if ignored will be calamitous but with, if dealt with today, will be to everyone's advantage. Outside of Europe, few governments seem willing to take up the challenge of leading rather than waiting for the problems to become so serious. <coughs> the civil service in many governments, yes, but the political arm in, in Canada and in the Republican part of the United States is generally hostile to such efforts. <coughs> So what can the leaders do? 
what we want to say is we have a serious problem here, but a problem that can be dealt with to our mutual advantage. All it takes is a bit of effort, then we all will be better off with new, cleaner, more efficient technologies take <coughs> when they take over from the more polluting ones. We can leave, leave a better world to our grandchildren and, <coughs> and in the process make a not too high cost, make an even better world for us today. A bit of hyperbola? Yes, possibly. But I remember when the hippies told us, make love, not war, which we followed with great enthusiasm, I might say. <laughs> well, I say, make hope, not fear, because half the battle is political. We must persuade people, not by frightening them, but persuading them that there is hope. Now, my suggestion of free solar panels to every single household paid for by the energy that you save won't solve all our problems, but it'll persuade people that you can do it. So some solutions to some problems where we can create hope is a critical stage in, in the end, solving all of our problems. Thank you.